When we started this work, we knew almost nothing about ammonia emissions from beef cow feed yards. As a matter of fact, some of the uh, earliest work uh, was done in the feed yard north of here by Hutchinson in, in the mid 80s. And that stood for a long time as kind of our state of the art knowledge of ammonia emissions from feed yards. So we uh, set out to uh, improve on that understanding, and uh, after looking at ammonia emissions for seven years, uh, we, we think that we have a pretty good handle on what's happening with ammonia emissions from cattle feed yards. Uh, quickly, the reason we study ammonia is it has a number of impacts, uh, including amongst those, it's a precursor to respirable bowl Particulates, you see in the Central Valley of California, that is not fog, that's a particulate haze uh, that results from the combination of urban and agricultural uh, emissions. You can get over fertilization of sens sensitive ecosystems. This is a, a short grass prairie near a f on our laboratory near a feedlot. This is in 1940 in which you see a typical short grass prairie. And after 30 years next to a feed yard, it basically became uh, an annual weed pasture. Uh, reactive nitrogen in the form of ammonium in uh, surface waters can result in algal blooms. And finally, about every year, about 2 million tons of nitrogen flows down the Mississippi River, uh, which uh, contributes to the annual occurrence of this uh, hypoxic dead zone. Just briefly uh, to show you the how nitrogen flows to the feed yards, uh, ultimately the nitrogen comes from the atmosphere through the, the miracle of the Haber-Bosch process, which produces fertilizer, goes into feed. Uh, we're going to assume uh, 100 units of nitrogen in this example in the diet. About 15% uh, of that is retained in the beef animal and 85% uh, excreted uh, onto the pen surface. Uh, there's a slight amount of runoff in our Texas feed yards, maybe about 5% that goes into the retention ponds. Uh, about 20% of the Nitrogen is removed, goes into stockpiles or composts, or is land applied, uh, leaving about 10% on the feed on the uh, pen surface. Most of that on the pen surface is ultimately volatilized and lost as ammonia, with just a very small fraction uh, lost from the retention ponds and land application. And as we'll see. About 50% of what was, what was fed ultimately is returned to the atmosphere. We intensively studied three feed yards during uh, the seven years of research. This is feed yard C. It's uh, a little larger than the uh, median size of feed yards, which is about 32, 33,000. Uh, feed yard A was a, a, a smaller than median feed yard. And this is feed yard E. Now, during the course of the years, we, we had several studies that looked at uh, emissions from these feed yards using a, a pretty wide variety of methodologies. And as we, as we intensified our study of these feed yards, we slowly started to, number one, refine our methodology, and number two, we started to bracket those emissions so that we started to kind of get, a, get clusters of summer emissions, clusters of winter emissions, and as our knowledge uh, increased, we finally settled on this methodology uh, to quantify ammonia emissions. Uh, we used uh, wind tracks, an inverse dispersion model, and we uh, there's several advantages to wind tracks. Number one, 
the measurements that it requires can be fairly simple. You need a measurement of ammonia concentration. And for that, we used either gas washing in our early studies or open path lasers in our later studies. You need to somehow quantify atmospheric turbulence. Uh, sonic anemometers will do that quite well. And then you have to carefully define your source area. So for each feed yard, we would uh, <clears throat> uh, create a map of the uh, pen area that defined uh, where the ammonia was coming from. The advantage of using open path lasers is that we can get near continuous measurements uh, year round. This is the, the first work we did at Feed Yard C. Uh, we were able to conduct six intensive seasonal campaigns in which we had a total of 43 days of data. And when we uh, integrated those into seasons, you have the uh, darker bars are the fed nitrogen, the lighter bars are the uh, ammonia N that was emitted. Uh, a couple, some patterns started to emerge. Uh, first of all, winter emissions were tended to be about half uh, summer emissions, and when you, they tended to, the winter emissions tended to fall in this uh, oh, 50 to 75 uh, grams per head per day, and the uh, summer emissions uh, were fairly uh, consistent at about 110, 120 grams per head per day. These are data, two years of data from feed yard A and feed yard E. These are mean monthly emissions. Each one of these months has anywhere from, from 7 to 28 complete days contained within it. Uh, this year one, <clears throat> the emissions from both feed yards tended to be very similar. You can, you can also note that uh, emissions, just like... Uh, April showed with her, her uh, diel emissions. Uh, on a seasonal basis, emissions tend to follow temperature with higher emissions during warmer season, lower emissions during the cooler season. But you can see in year two something happened, and something happened right here. Emissions at feed yard A just exploded compared to feed yard E. And that's explained when we look at the crude protein in the diets fed at the two feed yards. Right here, feed yard A began to substitute wet distiller's grains, the byproduct that Andy just reported on, for corn in the diet. And like Andy showed, when you substitute wet distiller's grains for corn, you increase the crude protein in the diets. So, we went from about 13.5% uh, to 19% at feed yard A. That excess nitrogen is mostly excreted and it's mostly volatilized and then lost as ammonia. So during, during those months when uh, feed yard A was feeding the wet distillers grains, those ammonia emissions added, averaged about 50% greater than those uh, that we saw at feed yard E. And when we uh, annualize those emissions uh, and put them on the basis of a fraction of fed nitrogen, we see that <clears throat> about 50% of the fed nitrogen was lost as, as ammonia uh, uh, during these feed yard, these three feed yard years. But during that year when uh, uh, distillers grains were fed and we had high crude protein, that fraction of ammonia lost as nitrogen uh, went up to about two-thirds. So this this uh, kind of su summarizes the, uh, the per capita emission rate uh, at the uh, three feed yards uh, over, over the seven years. 
again, you can see the effect of the uh, distiller's grains right here. It in uh, increased the per capita emission rate uh, over uh, what uh, averaged about a, uh, roughly a quarter of a pound uh, per head per day at the other feed yards. During the summer, uh, the results were fairly consistent. About 70% of the uh, nitrogen fed was lost as ammonia. Uh, uh, winter, that probably averaged about 40%, and on an annual basis, anywhere from 52 to 50% of the nitrogen fed to cattle was lost as ammonia. We're going to look at a range of studies from Texas, New Mexico, Nebraska, and Alberta, Canada, and we start to see a pattern emerge uh, in ammonia emissions. Again, winter emissions are coming in right around this 30-35%, and summer emissions up in the 60-70% uh, to 70 range. So if I was going to leave you with two numbers to remember, they would be this. In a well-managed diet in which you are meeting the protein needs of beef cattle, in other words, far, uh, feeders are doing the best job they can, you're probably still going to lose half of the nitrogen fed. And if we, and, and we are often asked, well, about emission factors, and, and that still is the paradigm that's used to calculate emissions. Uh, emission factors have tended to be too low. Uh, reviews of literature that, uh, that have looked at emission factors have usually been in the, in the uh, teens, uh, as far as kilograms per head per year. Uh, this, this is 40, 40 kilograms per head per year. But we are recommending <clears throat> a higher emission factor, uh, 88 pounds per head per year, uh, which is 40 kilograms per, uh, per head per year. So ammonia is a significant loss of nitrogen from feed yards. Half of it's going to be lost even if you're feeding optimum diets. That's going to amount to about a quarter of a pound or about 110 to 120 grams per head per day. And we're recommending an emission factor of 40 kilograms per animal. Now, this is based on one-time capacity of feed yards. And our work now is focusing on getting away from that emission factor paradigm and looking at process-based modeling so that we can uh, uh, apply those more, more confidently to a wider array of feed yards um, that will get us uh, away from the emission factor uh, way of e estimating ammonia emissions. And I'm sure there are some bubbling questions, so I'd be glad to answer those. Yes, sir. Yeah, we actually, we actually can account for about 65, 70% of the variation in ammonia emissions just with temperature. And temperature can be used as a, as a way to empirically estimate mean monthly, mean monthly emissions. Uh, 
And I have a paper that's just going to be coming out in JEQ that does that. Uh, it's, it's, it works pretty well, actually. Uh, and I would encourage, if you have ammonia emission data, to look at temperature in your, in your area and your production systems to see if, see if that em empirical approach has any, any robustness 